Basics program, which is a program we do here at She is the Music, uh, which is focused on the basic fundamentals of the music business. And tonight is the one I have, am most excited about and have been waiting for. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Susan Dotis. I am the global co-chair of mentorship along with my partner in crime, Cynthia Sexton. I am a 25 year plus, my goodness, uh, major label A&R and music publishing executive. I am also uh, for the last almost 15 years, uh, been a professor of music business studies and I am currently a clinical assistant professor uh, in NYU Steinhardt's program for music business. Uh, so this uh, kind of stuff is close to my heart and I'm very excited for tonight's panel, which we'll get to in just a minute. First, I would be completely remiss if I did not give a major shout out to Miss Melody Sharshavrani, whose idea this was. Melody, hi, is up there in the corner. Hey. Melody is a member of our mentorship committee. Uh, but she knows about this, what we're going to talk about tonight better than anyone because, Mel, you were, what, a 2019 graduate from USC? 2020. 2020. 2020 graduate from USC's Thornton School Music Industry Program. She was uh, an intern, and then she got the gig. And so she knows uh, the do's and don'ts of what it takes to get a job in the music business. And to her credit, she was the one that came up with the idea for tonight's program, and I think it's a brilliant one. Uh, both as somebody who's hired many, many people in the course of my career and as a professor training uh, our students uh, how to get jobs in the music business. This is, this is just um, a really exciting event um, from my perspective. So let's get right into it. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, the building of the resume. This is the first of a three-part series that we are doing on career basics, or as I like to call it, how to get the gig. So obviously part one is gonna start with resume building. Please note that part two and three will be on the upcoming Thursdays. Part two, which is interview basics, is gonna be next Thursday, September 29th, at the very same time, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time, and part three, which is the entry level job basic. So you've actually gotten the job. It's likely if it's an entry level position, it will be an executive assistant job or perhaps a coordinator job. What are those jobs actually? And what is expected of you? That will be our third panel uh, with some young people who actually hold those jobs, who actually have the experience uh, to talk about what it takes to get those jobs and do a good job. Um, we have some great panelists for that. Uh, if you cannot make any of the, our subsequent programming, fear not, because we put all our basics up on the She Is The Music, Music Basics YouTube channel. You can watch any of our workshops at any time via our YouTube channel. So uh, we hope to see all of you here in the next two Thursdays, but if for some reason you can't make it, fear not, you can always watch us on YouTube TV. Okay, so let's get started with tonight's panel. We have three really amazing guests because these are the women that really know how this thing works. They have all the tips and all the tricks and they can uh, really hone in on what it takes to craft a great resume that will allow you to uh, get past tier one of the job search and actually possibly be considered for uh, an interview. Uh, as we go on tonight, uh, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We're going to try to uh, leave 15 minutes at the end of tonight's session for questions from our audience for these three wonderful women. Uh, so use the chat if something comes up that you want us to dig a little bit deeper in. So let's get to our panel. So first we have Molly Kemper. Uh, she is currently the manager of early careers recruiting at William Morris Endeavor. Uh, one of the largest talent agencies in the world, maybe the largest, I'm not sure, Molly, you might know that. Um, uh, Molly, um, uh, prior to working at WME, she spent six years at Warner Media. She is uh, in charge of looking at the music rotational assistant recruitment positions and agent assistant recruitments across the agency's US offices. So if you're interested in getting an entry level job at WME, Molly is going to likely be the person that you will come across. 
She's an alumna, uh, an alumna of Pepperdine University where she majored in advertising in Spanish. And outside of work, she loves music and hanging out with her dog. Me too, I love hanging out with my dog. So welcome, Molly. Thanks for having me. Um, next, we have uh, Marley Crow. Now, Marley brings a very interesting perspective because she's not actually a recruiter, but she knows how to prepare you to deal with the recruiter. <laughs> Molly is a graduate of Spelman University in Atlanta, Georgia. She's now living in LA. As she moved up the corporate ladder, she began to realize that fewer and fewer people actually look like her, and she set out, out to help diversify a uh, professional uh, who could then have a chance to achieve career success. Uh, she's founded uh, a very interesting company called C-Suite, uh, which is a company that actually um, helps people prepare resumes, prepare for the interview process, and really be knowledgeable about what to expect as they, as they um, uh, set off on their job search. In addition to that, uh, in 2019, she founded uh, a workwear boutique. Right, this is really pretty interesting. This is where you can actually go and uh, find out where to buy professional clothing, what the look is for a particular job you may be interviewing for, et cetera, et cetera. These two companies, the resume, the preparation for interviewing and her, um, her clothing advice company uh, are all under one company called C-Suite and the, re and the re website for that is called Shop Suite. It's Shop Suite, S-U-I-T-E dot com. Melody's gonna put it in the chat. Uh, to date, Marley has helped over 150 clients land executive roles at top companies such as Google, Delta, and Accenture. And she's helping them dress for their most memorable career moments. And I love this tagline. C-Suite helps every boss land the job and look the part. And I love that. So welcome, Marley. And finally, we have Tiara Bradley. Tiara is the recruiting manager for Universal Music Group's People, Inclusion, and Culture. She has a BS degree in human resources management. Uh, and she was born and raised in the Bronx. Shout out to the Bronx. Um, Tiara uh, came to UMG from the e-commerce division of Walmart. Uh, she transferred uh, before when she was at Walmart, she transitioned into a role on Walmart's global talent acquisition team, which allowed her to continue talent leading efforts at Bonobos while also adding additional brands to her portfolio. Um, Tiara specifically, and correct me if I'm wrong, you specifically deal with recruiting for marketing, A&R and brand partnership divisions of UMG, right? Very hot areas. So if you're looking at jobs uh, at UMG in those areas, Tiara is likely a person that you will come across. She's a huge 90s R&B fan. She's a proud member of Beyonce's Beehive. Um, and she loves spending time also with her pup. So we've got a lot of dog lovers on tonight. So welcome ladies, really excited to have you. Let's jump in right away. So the first thing we're gonna talk about tonight is building the resume. The do's and don'ts and the common mistakes that pop up on resumes, um, which by the way, as we all know, resumes are the first thing people see. So in order to, to even get into the competition for a job, you gotta make sure that resume is great. So here's the question. What key points or information do applicants need to include in their resume? And specifically, in what order should they include these key elements? Um, so how are they gonna construct the resume? In what order are they gonna include the key elements? And then we're gonna to get to, if you construct your resume in a certain way, do you actually need a cover letter? So Molly, jump in here, what do you think? All right, well, I would say as far as sections go, there's, I wish there was a one size fits all resume. There's different things that works for different people. But from my perspective, especially when you're early in your career, I love to see um, if you have a summary section, then the education and then all of your work experience, but keep it all to one page. That would be my biggest advice, especially early on as far as the, the format of the resume. So first key point here is keep it to one page. Definitely. Marley. 
Yeah, same thing. I can echo Molly. Um, summary, uh, also a skills section that's going to get you through the applicant tracking system, which is the software a lot of companies use um, to filter out their resumes. So make sure you have a skill section that has the skills directly from the job description is huge. Um, if you guys are early career education at the top, if not education at the bottom, um, and so summary skills, work experience, education, um, there's definitely areas for community engagement and things like that. Um, like Molly said, there's not one size fit all, just really depends on your experience. And, and Marley, what do you think about adding things like interests or hobbies? Is that something that's still necessary? Is that too much information? I think it just kind of depends on where you're applying. Um, smaller companies that might like stand out, but if you're talking with a recruiter that looks at 300 res resumes a day, like I don't think, you know, oh, she likes riding her bike is gonna be like a huge deal breaker. So um, so I think that it just kind of depends. Um, but if you're like reaching out to a smaller company, um, like for example, like a dog friendly company and like putting that you love your pup in an interest section, could be like a good fit. So just kind of depending on where you're applying. Okay, great. Tiara, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I agree with um, what the both of them said, but one thing that I do want to point out, and I think it's very important, and I know we chatted about this, um, is that it's important for you to have a few iterations of your resume, right? Um, not asking you to recreate the wheel. Your experience is your experience. Um, it's not going to change unless you go out and get more experience. Um, but it is important for you to tailor your resume to the types of positions that you are targeting. Um, and what I mean by that is when you when you look at an organ organization, there are functions that are pretty broad for the most part, like technology, um, marketing, for example, which I work pretty closely with um, at UMG. So you have like traditional marketing, um, global marketing, digital marketing, which is an entirely, you know, beast on its own, right? Um, so it's in, in the same goes for genre. You can have experience in pop, rock, um, urban, so it's really important for you to tailor your background to the types of roles that you are, you know, that you are targeting. So it's important to go out, do some research, look on the career site to see what companies are, you know, what skill sets they're looking for and figure out how to incorporate that into, into your resume. So just going back to this uh, concept of a summary or a profile at the beginning of the resume, historically, you know, we, as older people in the business or as professors, were uh, suggesting to students that, that that should be some kind of mission statement. I'm getting the feeling that's not really relevant now and that the summary or profile should be more personally oriented. So um, if you guys can just elaborate on that a little bit, we'll, we'll start with Molly. Yeah, so this is another thing where you know, it's not a one size fits all, but from my perspective, I like when the summary section is kept pretty short and sweet because if your resume is one page already, you know, that's it's all right there anyhow. Um, but I think you can use that summary or objective, whatever you end up calling it, to your advantage. And um, I think there's a way, if you word it right, where you can do something to the effect of leveraging X, Y, and Z experience to pivot into a career in blah, blah, blah. Like you can both summarize your experience and capture what you're looking for. That's the ideal statement or summary, at least in my opinion. So if you do that, if you mm -hmm. optimize that section correctly, that then um, would lead to my next question is, this is why you don't really need a cover letter, correct? Correct, in my opinion, and just knowing the agents I work with, they just wanna see the resume 90% of the time. If your resume, your resume should stand independent of your cover letter. If you do choose to write a cover letter, we shouldn't have to read that cover letter to make sense of your resume. Got it. Got it. Marley, any thoughts on this? Yeah, just um, echoing my, I love what she said of like, yeah, your resume should be a standalone. A lot of people like use a cover letter to kind of build out on the resume, but a lot of times they're not even going to look at that. Um, also, I would say for the summary using adjectives um, that align with the role. So for example, if you're applying for a data analytics role, describing yourself as an analytical and results, results driven person, I'm like, okay, well, they're analytical. Also, um, taking 
key phrases from the job description again and putting that in your summary section. Um, it's all in the job description on LinkedIn or whatever. So if they want someone that can excel in a fast paced environment, put that in your summary, like take those same things and put that in your summary. But to Molly's point, keep it short and sweet. Um, I try to stay between four uh, lines at most, five maybe, um, so you can keep that resume real estate and have room for everything else. Um, uh, Tiara, I want to ask you a specific question. Um, let's talk about tailoring your resume for the position you're applying for. So we, we, we touched briefly in our last discussion, you know, people don't need to have like seven different resumes, but you can tailor your resumes for a specific position. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I feel like a lot of us have pretty diverse backgrounds, right? Like if you look at me, I'm, I'm working in music, but prior to that, I was at Walmart. I worked, um, you know, in luxury cosmetics, men's fashion, so on and so forth. So I think, you know, when you are applying to whether it's a different industry or a different type of position, it's important to understand like what that area calls for and be able to apply it to your experience. That's not me. That's not me saying to um, to say that you have experience or skill sets that you do not have. That is not what I'm. That is not what I'm saying. Um, but figure out how you can leverage, um, you know, your background and what you've done in order to make it um, resonate to the person who is on the receiving end. Molly, what do you think about photos on the resume? They look great, mm -hmm. but do we need them? And given the fact that we're talking about one page, they take up a fair amount of space. Mm -hmm. so what's your thought about photos on resumes? I am not a fan of photos on resumes. You know, there, there's a photo on LinkedIn. You know, it's, it's resume is not the place for it. Um, I Not only does it take up valuable real estate, but from the recruiter perspective, I want to have the least opportunity for when I'm sharing resumes with teams for any form of bias, whether conscious or unconscious. And so that's why I don't think that there should be a photo on the resume. Okay. Um, let's talk about um, the sort of design and the look of the resume before we moved on to LinkedIn. Um, I have seen some incredible resumes in terms of the design. Um, very clever. Um, at the same time, sometimes the design takes away from my ability in our ADD world to quickly get the information that I need about the person. So um, from all three of you to just quickly, what do you like the layout to be? What's the most efficient and effective way for that resume information to jump off the page for you? Tiara, we can start with you and we'll just go, we'll go backwards this time. Sure. Um, I would say, you know, keep it basic, right? Basic doesn't necessarily mean boring. And again, just going back to the roles that you are targeting, right? So if you are more corporate, whether that be HR, finance, you know, things of that nature, it's okay for it to be plain, but still eye-catching. Um, one thing that I do want to note here, since I do spend a lot of time within the creative space, creative resumes are a thing. Um, but I do want everyone to be mindful that like if there are too many graphics and I don't, I don't, I don't think a lot of people know this, but if there are too many graphics on a resume and you apply for a job, it goes through the ATS, the applicant tracking system, right? Um, historically applicant tracking systems were, you know, generally built to read text on a word and PDF document. So if, there, if it's too busy and there are too many graphics and photos, there is a possibility that um, it may not download, we can't open it, um, the format may be a little bit off. So that's why I always say, you know, basic doesn't mean boring, but be mindful if you do have a creative resume um, of how many, you know, photos and visuals you have. That's great advice. And it leads me to Marley, who all, her services offer how to construct a resume. So Marley, you know, people are paying to get this done. So I guess what both Tiara and Molly are saying is you don't need to pay somebody to, you know, craft a work of art here, that you want to work with someone that really can, can get the most effective uh, 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 sort of layout for the information you want to convey. 
Yeah, and so definitely. So when people hire me for a resume revision or development, I use pretty much my same template for almost all my clients. So that same template that I use has worked at Google and Delta, Accenture, Slack, Calendly. I have like the same basic, it's typically black and blue or all black. And it's really the content that matters. And I really echo Tara's point about too many graphics, sometimes unnecessary graphics. I, I love Canva, but I'm a fan of a Word PDF. Um, resume. It's just easier. And I've been on the other side hiring too, where you can apply uh, via LinkedIn. And it's a normal PDF that they can glance at real quick is always the best. And again, just not the unnecessary graphics. Like I've seen that like skills section with like the bars and I'm just kind of like, are they okay at Excel? Or like, I don't know what these bars mean. And they just have these random bars on the resume. I don't know. Like, you know, so just simple, the sections we have, that's what's going to get you the door and bring your creativity and your interview and um, assessments and things like that. Excellent. Okay. Now you gave me the perfect lead in to talk about optimizing LinkedIn. One of the things I've learned from all you ladies and from Chris, who I see up there in the corner, is the importance of sort of the integration of LinkedIn with your resume. They should, from what I understand, kind of mirror each other. Sometimes you're looking at the resume and then you're looking at LinkedIn or vice versa. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, can each of you share one or two of your best tips on how to optimize uh, your LinkedIn page, uh, obviously prior to applying for a position? So let's go to Molly on this one to start. Yeah, so for the LinkedIn page, exactly like what you said, Susan, we want to see like sometimes LinkedIn does have more information than a resume because there's a bit more real estate as far as different sections you can add and things like that. But I, it's a flag to me if there's like positions that are on one and not the other and vice versa, because then it makes me call into question like how transparent you're being about your experience. So it's okay if you have a little more on LinkedIn, but I would just make sure everything that's on your resume is also on LinkedIn just so they you know are consistent with one another. Um, another thing and not to go too far off this because we may get into it later, but with LinkedIn, the more frequently updated, the more active you are just on the platform in general, the generally the more you're going to come up in searches because you're going to going to be seen as an active participant on LinkedIn, like from the LinkedIn recruiter perspective. Okay, fantastic. So obviously, um, when the, the more you're actively engaged with your LinkedIn page, the more, I guess, the algorithm picks up that you're actively out there and uh, you might come up in searches. That's a really good point. Uh, yeah. Mark, any thoughts on optimizing LinkedIn? Yeah, I'm with Molly. I could go on and on about LinkedIn. It's it's such a great tool. Few couple things that I can say: customizing your LinkedIn URL so you're easy to find. So LinkedIn.com/slash Marley Crow. If it's Marley Crow five seven eight, it's going to be harder to find. Putting that link on your resume. So taking the picture off, but if they want to see what they, you look like, they can click right on your resume. That's the thing. Um, mirroring. So a lot of companies you can apply directly with your LinkedIn profile, or they have LinkedIn Easy Imply, which is doesn't want to apply. Doesn't want to apply. You can apply with your LinkedIn profile. Also um, having those same skills. So if you have um, LinkedIn premium, or I think maybe even regular, they'll tell you like, hey, you're a top applicant for this role. It's because you have the same skills on your LinkedIn profile that they posted on LinkedIn. So it also helps you be connected with um with recruiters. And you can also turn your LinkedIn on to recruiters. And a lot of recruiters will DM you directly. And then just lastly, to Molly's point, following the companies you're interested in, engaging with their content online, liking things, posting things, it's going to have you come up in people's timeline. And, you know, it's going to curate your content. So now for me, I see a bunch of recruiters, I see a bunch of people posting jobs. So you'll start coming up. And um, that's also a more organic way. Because sometimes a recruiter will just do a LinkedIn post like, hey, I'm hiring people, they didn't post it or anything. And because you're in that right algorithm, you can DM them directly or comment and say, hey, I'm interested in this. Excellent. Wow. Excellent advice. Tiara, your thoughts on this? Yeah. So, you know, I like to advise people to think about LinkedIn as their 
personal brand, right? It gives you the opportunity to showcase everything that you do out that you aren't able to put on your resume, right? Like we all do things outside of our day to day, whether you are, um, you know, you have a leadership role in like a community or um, industry organization, you have awards, recognitions, you've been published in articles. Um, those are all really great things to add to your LinkedIn profile because it, it, it paints the full picture, right? The resume only gives us a piece of you in terms of who you are. And I think especially when you look at the music industry, we, you know, we're we're very we're very passionate people for the most part. And, you know, our our business leaders like to see, you know, what folks are doing outside of work. Like what are your passion projects? And LinkedIn is a perfect way to um, to showcase that. So I definitely think it's important to optimize the space with the things that you do outside of your day to day. So I would say to summarize then LinkedIn versus the resume. They should mirror each other in terms of profile, skills, and work experience. But LinkedIn gives you that added benefit of rounding out who you are as a person. And so when recruiters or, um, or talent acquisition folks like yourself look at the LinkedIn, they're like, oh, wow, that person has a black belt in karate. That's really interesting. Or you get a better sense of who they are as a person, and that's where LinkedIn comes in as an added tool. Would that be a fairly accurate summation. Great. Absolutely. Okay. Mel, let's get our first resume up on the screen. What we have yes. done folks is we've asked many of you to submit your resume and we've chosen two, which we have redacted. And uh, we are going to have our esteemed panel take a look at these resumes and give us some tips on how these resumes uh, can be uh, improved. So here's the first one. Um, uh, this person, well, I'll let you guys, uh, comment uh, this person from what I can tell is looking to build a career in the music business. Other than that, uh, she's, she, I'm assuming is interested in music supervision. So ladies, what, um, a few comments that you might have on this particular resume, how it, what's, what, what's good about it, what could be improved? Anybody can jump in. I'll start off with a, a couple things. I like that it's one page. It's clear how we went to letting the experience speak versus getting too distracted with formatting. But one recommendation I would have is from my, my own preference, I would flip objective and education because objective is that way to start off the, the resume. Um, and I'll, I'll let my other co-panelists here chime in too and I'll maybe add something later. I think the first thing that I agree with everything that Molly said, but one thing that stuck out to me is sort of like um, the formatting, right? Where you're starting the um, you're starting the sentences with lowercase letters. I think those should always be um, always be capitalized. If you scroll down a little bit, if you can, Yeah, so there's this like, it says marketing director Casey Jarman, there's a number there. So I would say I'm assuming those may be references by chance. Um, if that's the case, then I would, you know, definitely recommend a references section maybe at the bottom. It's not necessary, um, you know, if, if you get far along in, enough in the process, we'll, you know, obviously ask for your references, but I don't think um, it's necessary for the resume because you can use the, the space in a, in a better way. Marley, thoughts? Yes, I have a few, <laughs> but um, Tara and Molly, definitely what they said. Um, if we could scroll up, I personally, um, objective is a little outdated. So now we're saying summary or profile instead of objective. Um, I would put the objective above. I would actually put the education at the bottom. And just formatting wise, like when I'm looking at it, it's taking me a while to be like, okay, she was the catalog intern at Crystal Creative. It's better to have like the company, the name, and then the dates on the side um, to the right side. And then also starting each bullet with an action verb. So um, some of them are kind of um, okay, but like regularly communicated, I would have just started that with communicated. Um, you know, and then kind of thinking like combed through, I would change that to a stronger verb like researched, right? Um, 
you know, dissected, um, you know, manages really good, drafted, worked with, instead of worked with, collaborated. And then um, to Tierra's point, taking off the references, again, that's, if you get to that stage of the interview, they will ask, um, so you don't have to put that on there. Um, putting the education at the bottom and just, uh, yeah, so I like to stay with the format of company, um, title, um, city, well, not so much anymore because we're like in a virtual world, but times on the right. Um, and then, yeah, so just um, just kind of some formatting things, but the content is cool. And I can tell that they have some experience doing some cool things, um, but the format might distract someone before they can even get into the content. And just a really basic question, and Marley, you can take this. Um, how many work experience entries do you suggest? Most of the people who are on this call tonight are uh, people in college and in their early 20s. So, um, you know, they might have had two jobs in what I'll call the real world. And then we get into things like camp counselor or babysitting and things like this, all valuable work experience. But how many do you actually need to list? Uh, and, and how do you decide what to list if you have um, an array of, of work experience? Yeah, I don't think there's a number you could put on it. I just think put the relevant things. So if you're applying for a music thing um, and you were the manager at McDonald's, it's just not really relevant, you know? So just kind of keeping those um, things. If you're in college, I would think everything um, in college and beyond. So if you're a college student, recent grad, um, high school kind of doesn't really matter anymore. I also like to say um, no more than five years. Um, that's like if you were kind of more into your uh, career. So like for me, some things I did kind of really past my first job, I don't even include on my resume anymore because I've been in the career world for like six years. Even though I had some really cool internships, they were so long. Um, and then, you know, but as you get to a more um, professional resume, then you can add like a previous experience section and things like that. Um, but yeah, just make sure they're relevant and they're in order. And then, um, you know, if there's a large gap or whatever, speak to that in your interview. And when you say in order, in descending order, your most recent work experience first from there. Yes. Um, Kiara, quick question for you. Uh, so many students are trying to come uh, into the music business directly from having internships. Uh, how, do you, how do you like to see internships listed, particularly for entry level positions at UMG? Yeah, I think it, it depends. Um, if the only experience you have is internship experience, you can list it as if it was, um, you know, as if it was a full time position, right? Because you you had a role, you had duties, you had responsibilities. So we want to see that. When you look at our um, admin roles, our coordinator um, level positions, more so that entry level, the majority of the candidates only have internship experience and, and that's totally fine. Um, and we want to see that. So definitely be as detailed as possible, obviously, you know, within the within the parameters, but should totally include it on the resume, especially if that's the only experience you have. Okay, we have a question here from Jenna that's relevant to what we're talking about. Should you put positions you hold in student organizations or clubs at college on your resume if you are applying as a newly graduated college student? Do le obviously, it would seem to me if you have hold leadership positions or positions of responsibility in an activity at college, that, that might uh, be a worthwhile thing to put on your resume. Yeah, if I can uh, chime in, I definitely say include it. Um, again, just think about your resume real estate. If you've had an internship versus an organization, let's put the internship on there. But um, I definitely think putting your organization, sometimes it can come out in your favor. If you were in a sorority or something, you never know if the recruiter was in that same sorority. So I think sometimes, uh, again, this is as a college student. Now that we're like adults, it kind of doesn't matter. Like for me as someone a little older, but if you're just out of college and you were the president of your AKA chapter, that might be really cool because the recruiter might have been on that. Or if you were the president of the marketing club, okay, well, she's did, you know, and you could put some bullets there, like, you know, led all the social media for all three campuses. Oh, wow. Like, that's really cool. So I think if it's relevant, put it on there. And if it can help your case, um, again, just organizations that a recruiter might be interested in. Um, and obviously, Molly, um, 
let's say someone is applying to WME, if they were the concert booker for their university, that's the kind of thing you want to see on their resume Absolutely. rather than they were yeah. the president of the Italian club. Exactly. Yes. No, that's something um, I think I might have seen a question in the chat along the lines of like, well, if I haven't gotten the chance to have that experience or I haven't had internships at big companies, but there are some people like exactly to your point, Marley, like with sororities, if I've talked to people who were the event planner for their sorority and they were in charge of like reaching out to talent and different things, that's huge. So yes, absolutely. If it's relevant um, experience, totally worth putting on there. And it can actually really help you out if you have some insecurities about whether or not you have enough like internships and things to list. Fantastic. Okay, Mel, let's pull up the second resume. I think we have time to look at this next one. Okay. Uh, so here we have education up front, uh, the person's uh, major um, in university, um, and then a whole bunch of work experience, and Mel, keep going down, volunteer experience, uh, certifications and skills. Obviously, we know that should be up front. Uh, yeah, so let's start with Tiara first on this one. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Um, I like the format of this resume. Uh, I think the there's something off with the with the lines, and I'm a stickler for you know for formatting and things of that nature. So I think just for the record, it, it speaks to attention to detail, and I did want to mention that at um, on the last resume. So in full transparency. You know, if I were to send uh, a resume that had any type of mistake, whether it's a typo, if the formatting was off, um, hiring managers pay attention to uh, to those things. So I do want to make note of the the formatting. Um, just quick glance, we need some consistency in terms of the um, the dates. That's something that just automatically sticks out to me. So you see, I. You know, the first the first wall you have 2021, then the second one you have 2020 to 2021. So just also be mindful of that as well. Um, so those are like my initial my initial call outs, just first glance. Okay, so what you're saying is that do you want the dates to be more specific, like where it says 2020 to 2021? Do you want it to say January 2020 to July 2021? So you want more specificity in dates? For me personally, I prefer it to, to be specific only because, um, you know, when you're looking at someone's tenure in a role, right, 2020 to 2021, it could be a year or it can be, you know, it can be a month. Like that just like, I would want to know how long you've been there. So for me personally, I would prefer it to say, you know, May 2020 to, you know, June 2021 or something like that. Right. And in terms of the format, even from my untrained eye, I would prefer to have the dates all the way to the right, sort of flush right. And the, the name of the company and the position flush left and then everything following underneath on the left. That's the kind of thing you're talking about, right, Tiara? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Marley, you want to jump in on this? Yeah, same same things as Tiara. Those lines are like killing me. Um, like, so definitely a straight line. Just a quick word uh, tip. If you type dash dash press enter, it will make a straight line for you. Um, also, same thing. I want them to the right. Also, uh, like, yeah, more specific because it's kind of like with. Um, okay, so yeah, pocket pills, pharmacy, were, were you, are you still there? Did, did you leave? Kind of what happened? Um, I did want to scroll to the bottom for this, like, I was so distracted by the crooked lines at the top that I didn't even get to all these awesome certifications you have. And it's like, wow, like a project management certification and ad certification, like these are things that should be talked about in a summary section. You should definitely add a summary section and move those skills to the top um, and bulletize them, I think is really good. Um, and I do kind of want to put a call out on um, volunteer experience. This is a good experience. Um, if it's outdated or like, I, I remember one of my clients, she like volunteered 
at Salvation Army like one time. And I, she was like, why did you take it? I'm like, do you, would you rather look like you volunteered one time five years ago? Or do you wanna look like you're active in the community? So um, just think about that with like volunteer experience. So like if you feed the homeless once a year, I wouldn't really include that. But if you volunteer, um, you know, this seems like something he's more in a leadership role. Um, include that. But yeah, just formatting and really highlighting your strong suits because this certifica certification and skill section is so awesome, but I didn't get that because I'm distracted by everything else. And if I could answer one question in the chat, just in regards to how many bullets, I really wouldn't worry about the number. I think it goes with your experience. So if you were at a company for five years, that needs more bullets than the job that you were only at for like three months, you know? So I think kind of go off it for that, but I don't think like uh, well, I, I'd be interested. I don't know if Molly or Tierra had to say, but I don't think they're like, oh my God, this is three bullets and that one's five. Like they're, they want to just see what you did at each role. So if you were there for a long time, I definitely think that section needs to have the most bullets. Okay. Uh, Molly, final word on this one. Yeah, no, I would absolutely agree with Marley about bullet points. Um, one thing I would say is I would have more than one, like try to put two, um, but beyond that, it, it's not a big deal to me. This is actually going back to the point where we were talking earlier about tweaking your resume a bit based on the position, like the bullet points can change. Like that's where you can really leverage your resume real estate to help you out because you can on one job, if they mention a certain skill set a bunch, like you can emphasize that more in the bullet points, whereas like it may not be as important for another role. And then to go back to the summary section, um, of course, don't want to completely assume this individual's career goals, but just given that we're speaking about music, that's where that summary section could really speak to why, even though the experience has been more on the pharmacy biochemistry side, that is where you can use that that section to like explain why you're applying to music roles. And because I hired people, I actually just interviewed someone this morning that we're probably going to hire that majored in neuroscience, but she had a little blurb at the top that explained why she wanted to pivot to music. We had a great conversation. So that's just another recommendation I'd have. Yeah, and you know, I can just say from my own experience teaching in our graduate music business program at NYU, I've had students in that program who uh, were dentists, who studied in dental school, who were biochemists, who were uh, legal studies majors, right? And they're pivoting, take, get, getting an, a new degree to pivot so that they can do exactly this, apply for jobs in music. So um, I, think it, I think you make a great point in that you need to explain why your experience, your educational background suggests one thing, but why you're applying for a job that, that, that is uh, from a different, that, that's coming from a different angle. Um, okay, great. Uh, Mel, we are going to move on now to uh, the section that I've actually been waiting for. And this is the discussion of keywords and algorithms. Uh, I find this absolutely fascinating that this is sort of the, the, the first barrier that uh, applicants run into when they're applying for jobs. So let's talk about this. Some companies search keywords or implement an algorithm when going through hundreds or thousands of applications. Um, let's start with Tara and Molly. How do UMG and WME differ when reviewing resumes for potential applicants with your um, uh, applicant tracking systems? Uh, are you using, um, is, it, is it primarily keywords? Are you looking for certain, um, uh, a, a certain degrees or educational backgrounds? How do your systems work? So let, Tiara, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, Melody, I have a couple of visuals. Melody, do you mind sharing? Okay, perfect. So uh, basically an applicant tracking system, just a little bit of background, which is what we call ATS, is, is pretty much just that, right? It's a database that companies use to manage applicants, candidates, candidate communication, etc. So if you were to go to the UMG career site, you select the job, complete the application, submit your resume and hit send, you're in our applicant tracking system. And that comes straight to the recruiter. So what you're looking at right now is the recruiter dashboard. Um, some of the open roles uh, that my colleague Carly, this is not my dashboard, but um, that she's working on. Um, for, for reference, she primarily focuses on a lot of those entry level positions, right? So admin assistants, coordinators, those are high volume 
positions where you will, and you can see if you look um, next to next to the position, look a little bit over to the right, you can see hundreds of applications. Um, and this is not just specific to her. Our recruiters manage on average between 20 to 25 open positions. Um, naturally, we get hundreds of applications. So if you just do like super quick math, 20 positions, 200 applications per role, that's 4,000 resumes that recruiters are expected to, to comb through, which is insane. So where the algorithm comes in, it is um, basically a technology within the ATS where it ranks applicants. So if you go to the next, um, the next slide, perfect. And by the way, this is live data. This is from our actual ATS, obviously redacted any sensitive information. Um, but this is this is our ranking, uh, and Jobvite is our our ATS that we that we use. So you can see that it ranks candidates from very strong to weak. One thing, two things that I actually want to point out is that these rankings are solely based on keywords keywords in a sense of how well does the words on your resume match up with the words in the job description and i feel like we've we've been we've been saying keywords throughout you know throughout this session and it's that's how important it is right the ats is a technology it you know it picks up on the words that are in your resume so if a job description is calling for you know someone with you know five years of digital marketing experience. If you have digital marketing on your resume, it'll it'll pick that up just as an example. Um, so again, solely based on, um, on keywords. The second piece I wanted to mention is the algorithm is not a perfect science that right that like that's just the nature of technology. Um, it is used as a supplement to the recruiters who are combing through thousands of applications. Um, and another thing to note is, you know, applicants who are ranked as weak aren't automatically disqualified. And I do want to to make that clear as well. Um, again, it really just acts as a guide. So if you are using the right keywords and you know your application is lit as green, it just tells the recruiter, hey, you should prioritize this person because there's a better, there's a higher chance that they may be um, a better match in terms of what you're looking for. Um, but from my personal experience, I've I look at most of my applications, again, like 4,000 is, is a ton of is a ton of resumes to go through. And um, obviously, as recruiters, we do more than just, you know, sit and review resumes all day. But again, it really is, um, you know, it really is a guide. I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, I've personally hired candidates who um, who was marked as weak by the algorithm. That doesn't mean that they're not qualified. They probably just didn't have the, the right buzzwords on, um, on their resume. So Tara, I have to jump in here and ask you a question. So how would you uh, actually come to interview a candidate who was um, ranked as weak by the algorithm if the ranking happens before you even make a decision on who you're gonna interview? Um, if someone's ranked as weak, would you even look at their resume? Yeah, I can. So basically, um, how how our recruiters see it, when you apply to a job, we have like a list of candidates who applied. It's, it's typically... Um, is typically organized by date of application, right? So if a role has been open for, um, you know, for 14 days and you were one of the first five applicants, you know, because you're an early applicant, you are going to be on the first page of that. So that's how, that's how our view is. Um, and, and when you, when we're looking at the, when we're looking at the applications, it's color coded. Right, so naturally, if someone is green, we're going to prioritize the greens first because they are strong or very strong. If we're not getting what it is that we want or what it is that we need from those higher ranked candidates, naturally, we'll look at um, we'll look at the remainder of them. So you just made another great point, and I remember Chris bringing this up in our earlier conversations. 
the concept of applying as soon as the job is posted because you made the point that if you are an early applicant, you're up there at the top of the list. So can you just touch on that just briefly and then we're gonna jump to Molly on this. Yeah, so it's always, it's you know, especially if you're trying to, you know, to land a gig, um, especially at this level, because again, they are high volume roles, right? Like you just saw one of them 700, over 700 applications. It's insane. There's no way the recruiter is going to be able to get through all of those resumes. So when we're working on those high volume positions, as soon as we put them up, we are flooded with applications. So we are on top of it as soon as the role opens. So if you are, you know, if you're applying within that first, I even think a week is a long time, like the, those first couple of days, um, those are the folks who are getting looked at first, because generally speaking, at this level, you'll be able to, there's a lot of talent out, out there. There's a lot of great talent. So at that level, it isn't as difficult for us to, you know, to find a handful of well-qualified, you know, candidates to connect with and move through the process. So definitely stress if you're, if you're really looking to, to get ahead of the competition, set those um, those job alerts on, you'll be able to do it at the UM, on the UMG career site. Um, and you know, you'll get an email as soon as something is posted instantly. So to sort of encapsulate, apply early and often, that's pretty much what you're, you're saying here. Yeah. Okay, great. Molly, do you want to talk about how WME uses algorithms, keywords, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely happy to. So our system looks a bit different. We use a system called Workday and they all, and even different iterations of the same system can look completely different. So for us, we do have the ability to keyword search and I make frequent use of that, but we don't have the automatic algorithm where it will say like who's green or yellow or whatever it may be. So for us, so I agree with everything Tara brought up, like apply early, like that's something like things for our roles, like our, what many of you probably know is the mail room, like we post that and we'll get so many applicants real quick. So um, you do also show up higher up on the list if you applied earlier. Um, also, because we can do those keyword searches, but any search isn't perfect. Um, I know it can be a bit frustrating, but if there is the opportunity to like even if you upload your resume and then it will populate most of the fields from there, like go back and check it, make sure everything's fully filled out because that's just only going to help you in the search. Um, and as far as like what keywords to include, like that's thrown around a lot. You can usually figure out what's most important from the job description itself because you'll start to notice words like popping up more than once. So I one, I guess, piece of caution I would put there, though, don't completely copy and paste full lines of the job description. Like work some a few keywords into your bullet points. I've seen people straight up copy and paste the full job description split up between different jobs. It's not a good look. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Marley, do you do you want to sort of um, comment on this in terms of coaching people how to um, sure. deal with these algorithms, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, well, first I was like, thanks, Tierra, for sharing. That's like my first time seeing the other side. Um, so I'm going to drop a link in here to this cool Google extension that I just um, discovered, but you can add it as a Google extension, upload your resume, any job description you look at, it will give you a percentage of how likely you're going to get in there. So don't worry too much about it being like a hundred percent or something, because it's literally looking for all the same words. I would try to aim around 40 to 50. And this is a good thing. And it'll, it will highlight literally the words that you're missing. And so it's a good way to just kind of throw some of those words in. But definitely to Molly's point, please do not copy and paste anything. Um, just also, I use Grammarly. There's a really cool tool I just came out or uh, discovered copy.ai, which will rewrite certain sentences for you. So you could like, you know, write what you did and the copy AI will make it sound pretty and you could throw a keyword in there. So they're just kind of like some tools you can use um, on your end. Um, I don't know if I can ask kind of like a follow-up question here but Tierra and Molly like what about if um someone was like passed along to you do you guys ever look in the ATS system for that or kind of like how what is that type of situation yeah, that's a great question yeah. that goes to you get a call from somebody that a specific person has applied um do you actually go look for that person in your system see what the ranking is et cetera, et cetera. And this goes to something we talked about in our preparation call, the idea of actually 
reaching out to somebody, have somebody reach out to somebody at the company that you know uh, to get your name in front of the recruiter so that the recruiter actually will say, oh, really? Uh, Sandy Smith applied. I'm going to make, I'm going to um, asterisk that so I make sure I look for that specific resume. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say use your network. Um, it doesn't matter who it is within the organization, um, use your network. And I say that because, you know, employee referrals are a thing. And it's interesting because with our system, if someone referred you to a job, and it's actually part of our application process. It asks you if you were referred, if so, by who? If you say, yes, um, you know, Susan referred me for this job, on the recruiter's end, referrals have a completely separate, they show up separately from an, like a regular external candidate. It's like your active candidates and then your referrals. So generally speaking, we tend to tap there first because, you know, it's inside the family. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So if you if you know anyone, um, you know, definitely tap into your networks. Um, we get referrals via you know via job right the ATS. We get them via via email as well, um, and we prioritize them. So definitely, if you if you know someone or if you know somebody who knows somebody, um, you know, definitely share your resume, and you know they'll they'll you, it'll at least get you a phone call. No, I, I agree with that. We also, it doesn't completely filter them out separately, but there will be a note in bold their name to say that they're a referral. And I, I also get an email when someone submitted as a referral in our application system, like it comes right to my inbox. But I also get a lot of referrals just via email. And I, I'm not going to give someone the job because they were a referral, but that does help them get looked at because I know that like someone who's willing to put their name behind someone, like they at least like that's, that's their reputation. So I feel confident that if someone here is like, they'll be good, they're at least worth me looking at their resume, probably going to give them a call. But that's where LinkedIn can really, you know, go be to your advantage because I've had so many assistants email me saying so and so who also went to my school reached out to me on LinkedIn, I chatted with them for a few like, I think they'd be great. Would you mind taking a look at your at their resume like that happens all the time. That's great, great, great advice. Okay, so as I see, as I'm looking at the time, as usual, um, things go by so quickly. So let's um, let's get to um, uh, a couple of other things quickly. We'll sort of do like a lightning round. Molly, talk a little bit about these video interviews where the video gives you a prompt and you have five seconds to answer. Yes. So we don't currently use them at. WME, we did use them when I was still at Warner Media. Um, what I would say is that's where kind of practicing some questions beforehand. You may not see the exact question, but look through some common interview questions and just have some ideas in your head um, because that will just only help you with preparing for those. And also, we know they're nerve wracking, we know they're awkward, but as much as you can be comfortable in yourself in that and try to pretend like that camera is a person on the other side, that, that really reflects on how you come off in the video. Great. Marley, can you address um, anything that you've noticed as you coach your clients, um, very specific kind of algorithms or uh, specific uh, kind of te technological aspects of the application process that you want our audience to be aware of, that they may not be aware of? Um, I would just say definitely like LinkedIn is my favorite job search tool. It is, and, and we'll talk, I think there might be another session or something about LinkedIn. It's all right there. The job is there. You can find out who works there. You can find out who from your school went there. So like people are just not tapping into LinkedIn enough. You can apply for the job right there and it'll tell you who posted it. So then you can DM the recruiter right there. So, um, your LinkedIn is, it's so great. I've actually got like my last three or four jobs from LinkedIn. So I just don't think enough people are using it, but I also don't only use LinkedIn because I've had heard some people get some amazing jobs applying directly on the company website as well. So if it's a company that you're really interested in, I say go directly to the website, but if you're kind of just applying to a bunch of places, then I would um, use LinkedIn. So would you recommend that if you see a job, let's say at Sony Music posted via LinkedIn, apply via LinkedIn and also apply for that same job through the portal on Sony's website? 
Um, no, and it also depends. A lot of times it will link you to their website. Some have easy imply. Um, so yeah, don't apply both, but apply directly on their website. Um, but LinkedIn is a great tool to follow up with the recruiter and saying, hey, I just applied to this role. I'm very interested. Would love to set up a 15 minute call or something like that. Okay, fantastic. And um, uh, Tiara, question for you. We discussed this briefly earlier. Uh, pay level, what people expect to be paid uh, for these jobs. When and where does that come up? Is that something you're putting on the resume or is that something that you save until you actually get into a discussion with a live human being? How do you like to see that uh, presented? Yeah, um, please don't put anything related to compensation on your resume. Um, it's typically a conversation that you have with the recruiter. So. One thing that I do want to, to mention is that we cannot legally ask you anything about your current salary, your salary history, or anything of that nature. If you choose to disclose it, that's your choice, but we can't do anything with that information legally. So I did want to start there. Um, it's, it's a tough conversation a lot, a lot of the times, especially when you are, um, you know, working with a more junior level population. And, um, you know, candidates are hesitant to answer the question, right? Throwing out a number, a lot of the times it's an arbitrary number. You know, you don't want to throw out a number that's too low because you're selling yourself short, but you don't want to throw out a number that's too high because you may potentially take yourself out of the running. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a challenging conversation. So in order to combat that, I always say, do your research. Research market rates across different roles, across different industries. There are so many tools and resources that are completely free online. Um, so like salary.com, Glassdoor. Um, I was actually looking at Payscale the other day and they also have, um, they also have ranges that you'll be able to look at as well as resources in terms of how to approach the conversation, how to negotiate your salary and things of, uh, things of that nature. So I would say definitely do your research and through your research, you'll also find that, you know, there are certain roles or certain functions that are in higher demand than others, right? So naturally they're being paid at a premium. So I also want to, you know, want folks to keep that in mind as well. But, you know, in terms of how to approach the conversation with the recruiter, be open, be transparent. If you want to provide a range, that's great. Um, the worst thing that can happen is you have a conversation about it, right? And it's that's not the end of the world. So it's not as it's not as scary as people uh, think it is. Right, and I think you make a great point. As long as you're realistic, because you've done your research and you know what uh, similar jobs pay, um, you'll be able to figure out how to get to a somewhat comfortable place about compensation because you won't be, as you said, selling yourself short or asking for something that just is, you know, outside the realm of possibility. Um, so that's really great advice. Okay, so as we're, we're getting to um, sort of the end of, the, of tonight's panel, and I'm sure we could have gone on for another hour, um, here's a question that uh, I think is really important. And I have to say, uh, I think it's important to me as a mother of two college graduates who are looking for jobs, as a professor for all my wonderful students who are looking for jobs. What is your best advice to applicants who are continually applying, who actually are qualified for these jobs, uh, but haven't landed the job yet, may have not even gotten a uh, uh, an interview. I have sat with many students who've said, Professor Dotus, I've applied to 40 jobs and I haven't gotten one interview. Um, uh, what What's your best advice and how do we, we sort of end our conversation tonight on a positive note. Molly? Yeah, so not to be uh, LinkedIn's biggest cheerleader, but that's where LinkedIn can really come in because I, I mean, I've had people reach out to me in similar situations. And if I have a few minutes to chat, like I'm more than happy to. So I would use LinkedIn. Also, um, I think that especially once they're graduating or about to graduate, I feel like students don't take nearly as, no, as much advantage of their career centers as they could. Like use those resources they may have resume tips or that kind of thing or services like marley's there's always that approach but linkedin's my, my number one for trying to up that traction 
and and you're encouraging people to reach out directly. I mean, I sometimes say to my students, make a phone call. I know that's kind of an ancient technique these days, but make a phone call to somebody. You might get somebody on the phone. You might get an assistant who might be able to give you some information about the job. But but LinkedIn, you're really encouraging people to use that to contact people directly. That works best for me just because I often spend a lot of my day on Zoom or Teams like this on interviews. So it's much easier for me to respond to a quick email or LinkedIn message than if someone were to leave me a voicemail. Fantastic. Marley? Just echo that. Be aggressive. Be able to have like a pitch about yourself because you just never know what rooms you will come into. Like I was even telling them the whole reason I'm even like on this panel is like I met someone and I was like, she was telling me about this internship program. I'm like, oh, like I, I have this career company. I started talking myself up. I emailed her. I followed, uh, she gave me her tech, her phone number. I texted her. I followed up with my email. I was persistent. So if you think you're amazing, like speak and talk yourself up um, to Molly's point, rely on your career center. I love my career center. Um, talk to your friends, you know, DM people, even if it's not a recruiter, maybe you have a friend or a classmate that works or has a cool internship. Hey girl, can I show you my resume or can you show me the resume you use to apply? I also talk to people. I think what's missing a lot is that conversation of how people got the job. If you know someone that's doing something cool, say, how did you do that? Did you apply online? Did, were you referred? Like, you know, ask that. And one last thing I will say, um, if you have everything, that's great. But I also would say, if you have the time, um, invest in like a certification or take a course, something like that. That I just had a client the other day. He was in physical therapy. Now he's in brand partnerships at Amazon and he was like I took a Google ad certificate class put that on in his resume and he got so many calls after that so sometimes those course there's so many free ones out there and adding that to your resume and showing that you're trying to educate yourself that can also give you a leg up too fantastic point uh Tiara yeah um you know this may sound a little cliche but like don't give up Right. Um, you know, one size doesn't fit all, especially, you know, especially within UMG. So if you didn't, you know, if you if you apply to one role and you and it didn't work out, that doesn't mean you can't apply to another. Right. Because th th you'll find you'll find a spot for the most part. And one thing that I do want to note here is that anytime uh, a candidate may get a rejection email from an organization. Um, you know, the recruiter may say, oh, uh, you know, you didn't make it, but we'll, we'll keep your information on file for future opportunity. Um, that is true. That is a real thing. And I cannot tell you how many times I've interviewed a candidate they didn't get the gig and I went back to them because they made a great impression. Um, I believe in their background and what they're able to do and the impact that they can that they can have on the organization. So I will say, you know, keep trying. There are we post jobs almost every single day. If you take a look, um, you know, plug in our career site, if you take a look at it, there are a ton of opportunities there. Um, and we're always looking for, you know, for great talent. So I would say, you know, don't give up and, and keep applying. And that's really great to know, because I often wondered when they say, well, we'll keep your resume on file. I thought, yeah, really, really. Um, and that's really good to know that you do. And the, the other thing I just want to say, um, just from the perspective of someone who's hired many people in the music business over the last 30 years and see many of them go on to be very, very successful executives, um, you will find your place as long as you continue to educate yourself and you continue to hone your resume and your, um, your skill set to that job that you really want to do. And it's true, don't give up. Um, a lot of this is who you are and what you've done, but a lot of it is luck too. So, you know, it may just be on a certain Tuesday, on a certain month, that's your day, and that's when you're going to get the call back for the interview and, and get the job. So um, really just keep plugging. We've, we've gotten some amazing um, tips tonight, which, which I, I, uh, I think is so uh, important for people to know because, you know, oftentimes this application process is like, you know, sending your resume into the netherworld and you have no idea actually what happens once you put it through the portal. Um, I see we just have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to go to two questions that came up in the chat, unless Mel, you've got anything else. 
Uh, we have this interesting question about Workday. When it comes to Workday applications, do you recommend filling out the education experience and skill sections or just send your resume that condenses it all into one doc? Anybody want to take that one? Molly? So we have Workday. Um, in theory, once you upload your resume, it should populate a lot of that automatically, but it's not foolproof. If you have a couple minutes to go tweak it, make sure everything's in there, that's going to help you pop up in those algorithms and those keyword searches. All right, fantastic. Um, and the final question for this evening uh, is actually about uh, early career roles that might require uh, the applicant to move to another city, right? So we're in the music business. Lots of folks in New York are applying for jobs in Los Angeles or people in Nashville are applying for jobs in New York. Um, sort of how does that conversation, uh, who initiates that conversation if the candidate that's selected is in fact living in another city and has to relocate? How does that work? I've been having that conversation um, quite a bit. Actually, my last two hires are relocating from East Coast to West Coast. So it's definitely a conversation that you need to have at the very beginning, like in that phone screen with the recruiter. Um, anytime I notice someone is not local to where the job is located, that's one of my questions. Like, do you have plans to, to relocate? What does your timeline look like? Um, because I feel like because we're in this virtual world, there's a lot of assumption that roles are remote um, and that's not always the case. So I definitely think it's important to, um, to tackle that in the very beginning. Um, and in terms of, you know, in terms of relocation, were you, were you asking from a financial standpoint in terms of moving the candidate? Mm -hmm. um, I think for us, it is done on a, on a, case by case business, it really depends on, it depends on the label and the, and the business unit. Generally speaking, um, when you're looking at your entry level role, so like those admin assistants, those coordinator positions, relocation typically isn't part of our package. Um, for the most part, they, it's more like director and above. Again, depending on the label, it can be manager and above. But again, it's it's totally up to up to the business to 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 make that decision on whether or not they want to um, provide some sort of funding for relocation. Right. And Marley, just as an extension of that question, since you're advising on resumes, is it worth it to put a sentence on your resume that says willing to relocate? Is that information that's important on a resume? Um. I think it's it's really up to you. Um, something I would add in the location section uh, or in the contact section, sometimes you could put your location and then, then to like Tierra's point, they'll be like, okay, I see you're in New York, um, but this is a role for LA, you know? So um, that's just like something you can include at the top, like name, email. Um, and so, yeah, we don't put your full address anymore, but you can say Los Angeles, California. And then if they see that you're in LA applying for a New York role, it's kind of like, okay, she probably wants to do this and then bring that conversation up. Fantastic. Okay, well, folks, I am afraid we've come to the end of this, from my perspective, really fascinating and informative um, session. I cannot thank Molly, Marley, and Tiara enough. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, I think everybody here learned something um, that's going to be absolutely critical in their job search. Uh, I want to remind everybody on the call that uh, the resume is just part one. Next week, we're going to start to talk about what happens when you get the interview. Uh, you know, what are the best uh, practices for an interview? Um, everything from how you should look on the Zoom screen, including your background, uh, to, you know, what kinds of questions you should be asking the interviewer. So that'll be next week, September 29th. Um, same, same bat time, same bat channel, four o'clock, yep. seven o'clock. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. I have to give a shout out once again to the wonderful Melody who conceptualized this whole thing. And of course, a quick shout out to all my NYU students. I see you guys out there. Nice to see you guys. Um, thank you everybody. Uh, please continue to follow. She is the music, uh, on our socials. Um, it's not just for women. Guys, we welcome uh, you uh, to participate in any of our um, activities and our workshops. 
So uh, feel free to jump on a call or to email us if you have any questions. So thanks everybody for joining. Have a wonderful evening and we will see you all next Thursday. And thank you, especially to our panel. Thank you everyone. This is great. Bye. Bye.